Okay. <coughs> With that said, so tonight we're going to talk about the kingdom of God and um, this verse, Revelation 1, uh, 5 and 6. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. He made us a kingdom and priest. What, look at your translations and tell me, what do some of your translations say in chapter, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6? He made us to be what? A kingdom and priests to serve as God. So his his translation said he made us to be a kingdom and priests. Okay. Some translations say he made us to be kings and priests. The original Greek really says he made us a kingdom of priests. Okay. Which he made us. The word is kingdom. It's not kings. It's kingdom. Um, and we're priests. And if we're all priests and we're part of the kingdom, then we're all a kingdom of priests, right? Then in Revelation 5, 9 and 10, and remember they're all standing before the throne worshiping. It says that they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book, they're talking to Jesus, and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So what is the kingdom of God? And where is the kingdom of God? And what does it mean to be a priest? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay? So, <coughs> these are questions that are important. Because if Jesus, both of those verses that I just read, say that Jesus paid with his own blood to make us a kingdom and priest. A kingdom of priests, kings and priests, whatever, however you want to say it. Jesus paid for us to be that. So it's probably important that we understand what that was that he bought for us, right? So I told you earlier in lesson time that <coughs> in the Old Testament, from the very beginning, when in Genesis 3.15 at the fall, when God comes and he, he tells the serpent there's going to be enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman and he's going to crush your head and you're going to bruise his heel, okay? And they understood that, that somebody that came from Adam and Eve was going to defeat this serpent, which Satan didn't slither into the garden. He was an angel. He was a cherub. He was beautiful. We could, that's another whole lesson. But um, he, he looked, he was beautiful. He was an angel. He disguises himself as an angel of light, the Bible says, right? Um, but after the fall, God said, cursed are you, and you're going to slide around on your belly. <laughs> and <coughs> a lot of theologians believe Genesis 3.15 is the very first mention of Jesus. And Adam and Eve definitely believed that someone was going to come from their body in, in Genesis 4. Eve says, I've had a man, a, a, a boy child, the Lord. She thinks that Cain is the one that's going to stomp out Satan, right? Well, we know that that's not right. Cain stomped out his brother Abel instead, okay? But they understood throughout the whole Old Testament, they understood that there was this Messiah coming. There was this one coming, and he was going to set up his kingdom on earth, and he was going to reign. He was going to get rid of all earthly kingdoms and set up his kingdom. In fact, let's just look, go back to Daniel. Remember I said you can't study prophecy without studying Daniel. Go back to Daniel, verse chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, okay? He has a dream about this giant statue, <coughs> and none of the wise men can interpret the dream. So they go and they get Daniel, and Daniel comes in, and he, he interprets the dream for him. So I'm going to start in... Verse 31, okay? And this is, what, this is what King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. So Daniel's talking to the King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, you, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, Alexander the Great was the person I was trying to think of earlier. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I knew it would come to me sooner or later. What verse are we on? <laughs> Daniel 2, verse 31. 31. 
You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, that's important, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like shaft from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay? So I want you to picture this statue. The head was gold. The chest and the arms were silver, bronze, and then iron and clay, okay? And then the stone that's cut out from somewhere without hands comes and hits the feet of the statue and the whole statue crumbles to dust and blows away, but the stone turns into this great mountain that fills the earth, okay? That's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. So Daniel goes on to interpret the dream and tells him that, hey, the head of gold, that's you, King Nebi. Like, that's Babylon. That's you. And then, then this is Greece. And Alexander the Great is going to come in. And then this is whatever. Okay, then we get down to verse 44. And he says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And as much as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel tells him that God is going to cut out a stone, without hands. It's not going to be an earthly kingdom. It's going to be a godly kingdom, and he's going to crush every other earthly kingdom on earth. He's going to destroy every kingdom on earth, and his kingdom is going to fill the whole earth, and he's going to rule over the whole earth. This is what the Israelites believed throughout the Old, Old Testament. They believed Messiah was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom here, right? <coughs> so what happened? Is that what Jesus did when he came? <laughs> okay, so we're going to call this this present age. Okay, this is going to be the first coming of Christ. <coughs> this is the second coming of Christ. And this is the age to come. Okay. So Jesus came here, okay? He came. And I just ask you, did he set up this earthly kingdom where he ruled and reigned? And that's why the Jews, many of the Jews, don't believe that he was the Messiah. Because he did not come and set up a throne. He, he was from the line of David. Remember, the line of David was going to reign forever. Jesus was from the line of David. But he didn't come and set up this earthly kingdom like they all thought he was going to do. However, in Revelation, the verses we just read said that he has made us a kingdom and priest to God. So what does that mean? What does that even mean? So what happened when Jesus came? That's what I want to kind of talk about. And what does it mean <coughs> to us? Do you think that he set up a kingdom anywhere when he came? In each one of us, basically. So before he came, there was one that came before him, John the Baptist, right? And he he's out in the wilderness wearing goat hair and sackcloth or something like that, <laughs> living off the locust. And, and he's baptizing people. And he's telling them, repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Okay? That is in Matthew 3, verse 2. And then Jesus comes and he baptizes Jesus, okay? And then Jesus goes out into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil. And then he starts his earthly ministry. And one of the first things that he says in Matthew 4, 17 is the kingdom is near. The kingdom is here. He, he's like the kingdom. Let's look at it. Matthew 4. <coughs> Uh, 
17. It says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then down in verse 23, it says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. What does the gospel, what does gospel mean? Good news. Jesus was going around preaching the good news of the kingdom everywhere he went and healing people everywhere he went. Okay? What is the good news? What's the good news? Salvation. Jesus is the good news. What, but what does that mean? Salvation. Salvation from what? Sin. sin. Jesus saved us from sin, right? He saved us for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, right? So the good news is that Jesus, that we are in this cycle of sin, and there was nothing that we could do to get out of it, <laughs> right? I mean, they had 10 rules. They had 600 rules in the Old Testament, and they couldn't even, they couldn't do them. They said, oh, we're going to do all of that, and they couldn't do it. And so God told them in the Old Testament, I'm, going to, I'm sending a new covenant. I'm making something new, and I'm going to put my spirit inside of you so that you will walk in my ways and so that you will be able to observe my ordinances. The Holy Spirit is the good news. Like, we don't, we're not on our own here anymore, right? So he set up his kingdom on earth and in individuals. It wasn't this public kingdom that everybody thought was coming. It's this very personal, private kingdom between you and Jesus where he delivers you from slavery to sin and sets you free to live for him. And I think the sign of a true kingdom fellow, kingdom partaker is sin is not fun anymore. <laughs> Before Jesus, people don't care. They sin. They're living it up. It's all good. After Jesus, after that Holy Spirit enters in, it's not fun anymore. I mean, we still do it. We still try it. <laughs> and then we feel terrible about it. And it's not fun. And I think that's really the mark of a true Christian and a true kingdom prince or princess is that sin isn't fun. It's not fun. And why isn't it fun? Because we know that Jesus died for that. He set us free from that. It's the old man inside of us we're trying to resurrect. And Jesus is like, no, I've made you a new creation. Don't walk that way anymore, right? <coughs> so let's look at some of the verses, some, some verses in the Bible about the kingdom. I'm sure that all of you have heard <coughs> this one, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I, if you don't know Matthew 6 and what all these things are, he's talking about that God clothes the, the, the birds of the air and the flowers and, and makes them more royal than Solomon in his royal robes. And, and why are you worried about food and clothing when God takes care of you, right? And, he, and then he stops and he says, but seek first what? The kingdom. His kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And I don't think that he meant, I don't think that Jesus meant, do what you're supposed to do and then you'll get everything that you want. I think sometimes it's misinterpreted as that. But I don't think that's what Jesus meant. I think he meant, if you follow after me and you try to bring the kingdom to earth, you know, try to be a piece of Jesus here on earth, then I'm going to take care of you. I might not give you everything you want. But I'm going to take care of you. And you don't have to worry about what you eat. You don't have to worry about what you wear. Right? So seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to, to you. One thing I want to say about kingdom is when you read about the kingdom of God, it's really talking about the sovereignty and the reign of God. Okay? So he's made us a kingdom of priests. So he is sovereign over us. He's reigning over us. He's our king. I mean, we don't really have a king here, but you know the days of the king. Back, we've seen movies, right? 300 or, I am Sparta, whatever. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, people bow to their king. They paid allegiance to their king. And 
Um, that's kind of, I think that's why they use, why he uses that term kingdom, because he's the king. He's sovereign over us. He rules. He reigns in our hearts. You know, we bow to him. Our allegiance is to him. I remember when I was a kid, <coughs> and we would say the Pledge of the Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I felt so much pride when I would say the Pledge of the Allegiance as a kid. I was so patriotic. I felt so much pride. And that's what God wants from us in his kingdom, is he wants us to be proud of him and honor him and reverence him and live in a manner worthy of our calling, which I think is the next verse, right, Amy? So Acts 14, 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. That wasn't the verse I thought it was. But did you hear what that says? Let me read it again. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Does that sound fun? No. Does he say, you follow Jesus and you get everything you want? <laughs> Does it say, you follow Jesus and everything be hunky-dory and awesome and unicorns and rainbows and butterflies? No, it says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Jesus, did Jesus have to go through tribulation to pay the price for you to enter the kingdom? So when you're enduring tribulation... He's conforming you to the image of Christ. It's beautiful when you really think of it that way. He's conforming you. The next time that you're going through something that's really, really hard, and, and it's something that makes you question God's goodness, I want you to stop and remember what Jesus did for you and what he went through for you. And I want you to turn to Romans 8, 28 that says, For God works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And who love him. And, and those he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ. And that confirmation, that transformation, that molding and shaping hurts sometimes. But Jesus hurt for us. So it takes tribulation to get into the kingdom of God. Colossians 1.13. We don't have time to turn there, but just write them down. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, hell, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, heaven, light. That's what he did for us, right? When he came here this time. <coughs> First Thessalonians, this is the verse I thought I was going to read earlier. First Thessalonians 2, 12. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So that you will walk in a manner worthy. And I'm telling you, we're about to dive into some deep scripture in Revelation when we start studying the churches. And you guys have just seen the tip of the iceberg as you were reading through. But God has certain expectations of us. And there is a way that we should walk to be considered worthy of his kingdom. Right? And he deserves it. Right? 2 Thessalonians 1.5 this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. John and all those disciples, they all suffered for Jesus, right? Just expect to suffer for Jesus. <laughs> Just expect it. And then Hebrews 12, 28. <clears throat> Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Let me say that again. Since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Remember the kingdom that Daniel was talking about? It's going to wipe away every other kingdom. It can't be shaken. It's going to fill the whole earth. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. He deserves reverence and awe. <laughs> and last but not least, Matthew 24, 14. And this, I want, I, Susie, you got to listen to this one. <laughs> Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. This gospel of the kingdom. What's the gospel of the kingdom? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That gospel has to be preached throughout the whole earth. And then the end will come. Okay? 
So what's our job as kingdom dwellers? Proclaim he, the gospel. To preach the gospel, to glorify Jesus, to share the good news. It's good news. It's like we're scared to share it. We want to keep it to ourselves because we're afraid we might get persecuted or people might think we're Jesus freaks. Well, call me a Jesus freak. That's like the best thing anyone could ever call me. Because you know what? He was a freak for me. He died for me. So, yeah. I love the term Jesus freak. <laughs> call me a Jesus freak if you want to call me a Jesus freak. Go right ahead. So, Jesus came the first time. He set up his kingdom in our hearts, okay, in individual hearts. And <coughs> he also did a few things when he came. And this is the message of the kingdom, that God, that Jesus gained victory over Satan, over sin, and over death. All right? Turn in your Bible to Hebrews 2. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I'm hacking up a lot. Somebody get up there and give me some drugs before I go home or Johnny's going to sit on the couch. <coughs> <coughs> Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, we're the children, share in flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise also partook of the same. In other words, Jesus took on flesh and blood. Okay, he was God. He took on flesh and blood, partook of the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So here's, here's what happened. When God created heaven and earth in Genesis 1... 26, he made us in his image, and he told us to rule over everything. This was our kingdom. We were kings, sort of. Princes, princesses. And he said, rule over everything. All, this, all the, um, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all the animals. You have full authority over everything. <coughs> when Satan came into the garden that day, and Eve ate that fruit and gave it to Adam, and Adam ate of that fruit, they handed over the keys to authority. To the devil. And the, I mean, the New Testament calls the devil the, the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air. I mean, he's ruling here on earth. Satan is ruling here on earth, okay? And we did that when Adam and Eve did that, when they handed over the keys of authority to Satan. When Jesus came, he bought back those keys for those of us who will walk with him and believe in him and trust in him. And he defeated the enemy on our behalf. Right? So let me read this again. Hebrews four, uh, 2, verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, because Jesus died, he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He rendered the devil powerless. Okay? Now, we look around and we're like, okay, the devil's pretty powerful. He's, he's ruling down here pretty good. Right? Have you watched the news lately? Okay? Hang on. So, he, he, he rendered him powerless, who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Who is that talking about? Who is subject to slavery and had fear of death? Well, we know that the wages of sin is death, right? That's hell. The wages of sin is hell. And we were slaves to sin before Jesus. We were. Romans 6 said that we were slaves to sin. But we're not anymore. Jesus freed us from sin. He rendered powerless the devil in our lives because he put the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is stronger than the devil. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Right? <coughs> so he rendered death powerless. He rendered Satan powerless. And he rendered sin powerless. Turn to Romans 6. And I'm going to have to... I always talk to you all. I always have too much to say. <laughs> Romans chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 12. It says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members of as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, <clears throat> for you are not under law but under grace. 
What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that through you, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Before Jesus, you didn't have a choice. You were a slave to sin. After Jesus, you have a choice. You have a choice of who you're going to present your body to. If you're going to present your body to be a slave to sin or if you're going to present your body to be a slave of righteousness. Right? We have that choice. And why do we have that choice now? Surprise. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us that leads us and guides us. And it's like, eh, 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 eh. don't do that. And we choose. Oh, okay, I'm going to walk in the flesh or I'm going to walk in the spirit. Right? <coughs> but Jesus broke the bonds of sin in our life. He rescued us. He, he took us out of Egypt. Right? We're no longer slaves to sin. Okay? We're not bound to sin. Jesus broke that chain. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? So, what is our responsibility in the kingdom? We said it's to preach the gospel, right? In Revelation 1, what did it say? That we're a kingdom of what? Kingdom of priests, okay? What does a priest do? Mediates for us. Okay, so in the Old Testament, <laughs> in the Old Testament, the priest was the go-between. The priest was the go-between between, between who? God, God and the people, right? So only the, the tribe of Levi. So remember, um, Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons. One of them was Levi. You had to be from that tribe. You heard of the Levitical priest. That's because they're from the tribe of Levi. They were Aaron's descendants. Which means Moses was a priest, because Moses and Aaron were brothers, right? So they were both from the, the tribe of Levi. So in the Old Testament, when they're wandering through the wilderness, God told them to set up a tabernacle. What was the point of the tabernacle? Does anybody know? Well, it held the presence. It's where God's presence was. So in the tabernacle, there was, I could draw it out, every single piece of furniture, every single way that, that, that it faced everything about the tabernacle points to Jesus. Everything. The bread of life, the altar of incense, everything points to Jesus, okay? In the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And over the Ark of the Covenant, God's Shekinah glory would come and dwell. That's where Jesus, that's where God was. Like, um, in Exodus 33, it says that Moses would go to the tent of meeting and everyone would walk out to their tent and see this smoke and they would all bow down and worship because Moses was at the tent of meetings and God's presence was there, okay? So they, they were wandering through the wilderness, so they would have to pick up this tabernacle and take it different places. Only the priest could touch anything in the tabernacle. Only the priest could take care of the Ark of the Covenant. If anyone else touched it, they would die. So there's this group called the Kor Korahites, the Korah, the tribe of Korah or something like that. And they were mad because they could only work in the out, outside, like not the inner room, but the, you know, the gates. And they were mad because they were like, well, how come you're so special? And so they decided to go in and try to <laughs> move the Ark of the Covenant or do something. And they all died. God killed them all. And later on, their descendants wrote this, the psalm. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Have you heard that song? Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't write that song. They wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in our day wrote the song, but they, the Korites wrote that because they were like, it's better to serve in your courts than to not be in your temple at all. But the Levitical priest, the priest, back to what I was saying, the priest, their job was to take care of the temple. Okay. When Jesus came, Hebrews 10 says, when he came, he tore the veil, okay? Because no one, only one priest could enter in the Holy of Holies one time a year to make atonement for sin. And they would tie a, a rope around his leg with a bell on it. So if he killed over, they could just pull him out so no one else had to go in there and die in the presence of God either. Okay, so it was holy, holy. When Jesus died, the veil was torn. 
He made a way for us to enter into the Holy Holy, so for us to enter into the presence of, of God, right? So where is the temple today? If we're priests, what's the temple we're supposed to take care of? Ourselves. Ourselves, okay? So turn to 1 Corinthians 6. <coughs> First Corinthians 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Our body is the temple. So, yes. Would you say that was? First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So if we're priests over our bodies and we're taking care of the temple, what does that look like for us? Does it or should it? <laughs> Good question, Pam. Good question. There, so in the Old Testament, the priests either completely neglected the temple. Like there, there, Josiah, King Josiah, he was eight years old when he became king. And when he was 16, he started following after God. And they found the book of the law lost in the house of the Lord. Because nobody, everybody had neglected the temple. Okay? So there was either those people or they set up idols in the temple. And, and I think that's very telling for us in our, in our temple. If we're just letting it go, if we're not spending time with God, if we're not taking care of getting rest and, and exercise and eating right and taking care of this temple that God gave us. Or if we're idolizing it and working out and running Iron Man's or something like that. And that's all we care about. Um, there's two extremes, okay? So if our body is the temple, and that's where the presence of God is, we should be taking care of it. And I'm not just talking about our physical body. I'm talking about mind, soul, spirit, mental, physical, spiritual health. We should be taking care of that. We should be spending time with God. We should be um, taking care of the temple, right? Right? And that looks different for each one of us. We know what our bodies need, right? <coughs> and what's best for our bodies. And we should be taken care of. There was another thing that the priests did. They made sacrifices, right? They were the ones that everybody would bring their burnt offerings and their sacrifices to. And the priests would take the offerings and offer them to God. Turn to Romans 12. So we don't have to kill bulls and goats. Hebrews 9 and 10, if you get a chance, go home and read Hebrews 9 and 10. And it talks about how we don't have to kill bulls and goats over and over every single year now because Jesus died once for all. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And he paid the price for all of our sins. And he tore the veil, right? <coughs> so we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to go kill animals. We don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like for us as priests to offer a sacrifice to God? Romans 12 one and two. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So what does it say that we're supposed to offer as a sacrifice to God in those verses? Our lives, right? And I don't think he's saying, go kill yourself for me. <laughs> because he doesn't say a dead sacrifice. He says a living and a holy sacrifice, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship or service of worship. Because it was a service of worship when they would offer burnt offerings and stuff like that. So as priests in this kingdom, we're to offer our lives. What does that look like? Offer your time. Offer your talents, offer your money, offer yourself to God. Say, here I am, God, it's all yours anyway. What do you want me to do with it? Right? So the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. And it's not a book that many people study. But I want us to take a look at it because so they had been in they had been in Babylonian captivity and God had released them from captivity and they brought a remnant back. To Jerusalem and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the wall <coughs> but we find them in Malachi again falling away from what they were supposed to be doing so flip over to Malachi real quick and 
think I got a few minutes. I wasn't going to talk about this, but have you been to that traveling um, temple? That went, it was in Platt City a couple years ago, and it had oh, like heard yeah. the yeah. tent, and it had the setup like the Holy of Holies. It was amazing. Yeah, we all got to lot in so Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. It was neat. That's and then you cool. wrote, I think, your sin or something on a piece of wood, and you threw it in the fire. Oh, or something. That's right. Remember? Yeah, it was neat. That's awesome. Neat. No, I didn't get to do that. Bummer. Next time, take Next it time, it comes you. around. Yeah, they said every few years <coughs> it'll be back. Okay, so in Malachi, this whole Malachi was it is called my messenger is another word for Malachi. Malachi was God's messenger. And he's talking to Israel, and he's really talking to um, the priest, okay? And it, I'll just start in verse 2, and I'm going to skip Which around. Chapter? Which chapter? Cha uh, verse 1. Chapter 1. <coughs> chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? <laughs> so right off the bat, <coughs> you see God comes to them, and he's like, I love you. And they're like, how have you loved us? Like they don't even realize, remember that he took them out of slavery to Egypt. He brought them through the wilderness. He gave them the promised land. He, you know, he, it's like they don't even, and sometimes I think this is us, guys. Sometimes I think that this is us. Like if we're not getting our way, we're like, well, how have you loved us? You didn't give me what I wanted. And that's not how God works. He's God. We're not, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to skip down to, uh, Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I'm a father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? You're presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And you, when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? So what's going on in this chapter? What's going on with these priests? What are they doing wrong? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> they're, bring, they're supposed to bring the very best. Right, the unblemished lamb, and they're bringing the blind and the, the lame, and they're giving God their leftovers. They're giving him their leftovers. And I think this is very telling because this is right before the Messiah is going to come. It's 400 years before. Malachi is the last book written in the Old Testament, and there's 400 years of silence, and then Messiah shows up, right? But I think it's very telling. Yes? So you mean nobody heard from God for 400 years? <coughs> 400 years of silence. He's patient, man. <laughs> Way more patient than I am. Yeah. But right before, I mean, the last thing that you see is these people that still just don't get who God is and what he's done, and they're bringing his leftovers. And so he, he was like, I'm going to have to send Messiah a better, there's a better way. But sometimes I think as priest of the kingdom that he has set up on earth in us, Sometimes we just give them our leftovers, don't you think? Sometimes we're like, well, if I have enough this month, I'll tithe. Or, you know, well, let me look at my schedule to see if that will fit in to all that I want to do. And then maybe I'll teach that class or maybe I'll do that class or maybe I'll sit down and do my homework even. You know, I'm not trying to convict anyone. I'm just saying that sometimes we give God our leftovers and he is worthy of so much more than that. And as priests... <coughs> we're setting the example. We're setting the example for our kids. We're setting the example for our neighbors. We're setting the example for our friends. We're setting the example of what it means to be a Christ follower. And he's, he kind of sets us to a higher standard. So why am I talking about all this? <coughs> I'm talking about all this because we're about to dive in 